all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show my favorite day today our one on one day so let's start our discussion so welcome everyone i hope that you are doing great and we have a lot of fun things to discuss and there are lots of very good questions as well uh, good news is in general we know that the immunity is longer lasting we know that pfizer and um, moderna both have actually become ready to apply for the emergency use authorization so that means within next few weeks we would have the vaccines uh, many people have tweeted to me that how would the vaccines be administered who should go first who should get it later what makes me happy is that we have reached the point of having these discussions instead of waiting and waiting and waiting so that is a good news um there are more drugs that are being approved as well so to me it seems like we are reaching a point of uh, containing this evil situation and uh, still there is time there are more weeks to go so please keep your guard up um don't take risks yet and then hopefully vaccines would be out there soon and we will be okay so with this uh so uh jim i totally agree with you i do not see remdesivir so let me give you an example of now seven people all above the age of 60 that i have treated in last 3 to 4 weeks all contacted me after becoming a little severe all were started on dexamethasone and remdesivir and they just kept declining oxygen saturation kept going down and then somebody gave them my number they talked with me they started them on supplements and the and the uh, ivermectin and then like magic it starts recovering so the other bad thing with the remdesivir that i've seen and so this is just my experience maybe it is just a one off chance that my patients actually experienced it this way liver enzymes and the renal enzymes raise very fast with remdesivir so there is a uh, there is a there is an issue with the liver and kidney although the remdesivir paper that i had shared in the past they say that well covid does it i haven't yet seen the kind of raise that i see with other patients who also have covid so there is there is something uh, again i do not have scientifically significant data to back up what i'm saying but this is my observation so it is good that remdesivir is out it is interesting that when uh, who went after hydroxychloroquine it had become a big news now it is really like a whimper nobody is really talking about it and somebody had tweeted to me that remdesivir seems like a drug that is looking for a use cool so how is everyone how is how are things how are you holding up um i know the times are hard but um i think it is important for us to continue to keep our guard up i'm going to start i know that there is going to be a long discussion so i'm just trying to socialize with you first So Margaret welcome thank you very much for joining Claire Robinson hello Asadullah hello Anthony hello easy microbiology good morning um good morning Shahida assalam wa alaikum assalam uh, Siddhartha good evening from New York good evening AS good morning good evening <laughs> the shri good morning so we we are so many of us i am so proud that we have joined hands together and we have been doing this together for so long now i think we are at 220 25 videos now so these are the topics that we have gone through together and learned about them about them one thing that i saw hi aisha one thing that i saw was uh, there is a youtube um subscriber cool bean his name is san from mike jose 
not currently in Mike Jose in San Jose. So he, his name is Mike from San Jose, but not currently in San Jose. He's a retired surgeon. He said to me yesterday that commented that maybe we should start a prophylaxis study where we solicit those cool beans that have been taking prophylaxis, get their information, their comorbidities, age, their area where they live, and then see the severity of the disease that occurred. And then based on that, we provide some sort of data. So he said, why don't you do this with Dr. Paul Merrick? I think it's a very interesting idea. What do you think? So with this, uh, let's start our discussion. Once again, welcome to everyone. This is drbean.com. Here is a good news. So we have made the Cyber Monday into Cyber Month. And so if you click on this check plans, this button used to be get your free trial. So if you go here, you would have a, a discounted price for this month. So if you wanted to purchase a lifetime uh, um, subscription, you can take advantage of that for this month. Okay, so that is that. Enough commercial from me. <laughs> so let's start our discussion here. So this is the this is the Twitter thread, and we're going to start talking about it. And so I'll do the same thing. I'll go there and then come back here. Before that, even I want to talk about the cool beans. So first of all, James, I believe that James is doing good. He had said that his uh, good boy, his dog, is as uh, loud as Luffy is. And I can't imagine what would that do to them. Uh, Luffy is a resident scholar. I'm sure that his good boy dog is also a resident scholar. He sent me a picture, but I haven't gotten his permission yet to show it. So after permission, I would show it. Then I wanted to talk about Rakesh. Rakesh Arora has been a, a YouTube subscriber, Cool Bean, on YouTube for a very long time. So today he sent an, uh, a note which I thought was really interesting. And this is a comment on YouTube. So it is not a private comment. So you can watch it as you can read it as well. I thought this was really interesting. So he said, Rakesh said, you saved lives of a group of 13. Me, it's a it's a long uh, a message, but I'm going to try to shorten it. So he said that him, three of his family members, two members of his neighbors, and six workers of a factory that was for his neighbor, I believe. Then two mates, they all fell ill to COVID on 28th October. And then nine of us were tested positive on 1st November. They were already taking some of them. Four of them were already taking vitamin D, C, and zinc as advised by you, me. So uh, on appearance of symptoms like fever, throat pain, and congestion, all of us started taking broad-spectrum antibiotics, amoxicillin, and then ibuprofen, famotidine, ivermectin, 12 milligram BD for five days. And November 3, none of us had fever. One of my maid lost smell, send the smell. Then five of us had throat discomfort and congestion. Then they had the, um, uh, everyone got well except myself and my wife. We repeated our lab tests and x-ray just on 14th November. My wife recovered on 18th November. Four of us had used budesonide and dolin, which is salbutamol and ipratropium. Repules, nebulization, as advised by Dr. Marek on your channel. I took budesonide nebulization from day six as I was very uncomfortable and the throat was choking. Within two days, my throat was cleared. I had better than gargles. I used nebulization every two hours. But when oxygen level dropped, release steroids were started. So oxygen therapy was not required. So his oxygen level actually dropped to 90. His age is, I believe, he's written here um, 62, I believe. So his oxygen level dropped to 90. And then as soon as the steroids were started, it went back to 94. Um, so my lab tests now show, show an improvement. Today, 28th November, my oxygen level is 94. I'm feeling much better today. My swab test is negative. After 21 days, I took complete rest and isolated for 22 days. I had taken one shot of vitamin D, 600,000 units on the second day of my swab test. We are taking omega-3 by taking fish twice a week. Since long, and uh, they've been taking walnuts as well, we take turmeric root, garlic, ginger, 
fresh onions daily. My vitamin D level is 56. Good for him. Uh, I have a walk today. I thank you for your valuable information you provide to us. I have no weakness today. All others have started their duties last week except me. Once again, thank you very much for your valuable teaching. I keep busy watching your videos. So Rakesh, number one, thank you very much for the note and sharing your experience and sharing your uh, method. And stay blessed and stay comfortable and stay healthy. I, I am very, very happy that all family members are doing good. Okay, so that is Akesh. And then other fam, um, um, cool beans, all of them have uh, recovered. And so um, I'm very, very happy and uh, very blessed that uh, I become worried. I think you know it. When I see uh, advanced age with comorbidities, with oxygen levels dropping, and then I am brought in a little later. So it becomes a challenge. And so happy that they are all well. So this is the cool bean updates. Now let's go to the questions. So the first question is, is lingering loss of taste and smell? So this is Seely Spinks. Is lingering loss of taste and smell considered a type of long hauler? What causes this after the virus is resolved? So I have done, uh, Seely, I have done a very uh, detailed discussion about this. Uh, I believe that the video's title is myalgias and fatigue uh, in the and the other neurological symptoms. So what happens is the basic mechanism is that in the in the roof of our nose, where the olfactory nerve is, which is tasked with the smell, the connective tissue around that becomes swollen and infected by COVID-19. Fortunately, it is not yet uh, seen that the COVID-19 actually goes to brain. And I know that some of you would now say that in the autopsies, people have seen COVID-19 in the brain. But that is a condition where a person has died. His blood vessels had opened up. He was in a cytokine storm. The blood vessels were loose. The brain, blood brain barrier would, would have been disrupted. And so COVID would be everywhere in the tissues. So we're talking about healthy individuals. Normally, it does not go to their brain. And so the, the glymphatic system becomes dysregulated, and that causes the uh, continuation of the sense of smell and the other neurological symptoms. So it is a kind of long hauling as well if it continues for a longer time. In that video, I have discussed some of the methods that you can use to try to help yourself. Of course, talk with your doctor as well. Um, in the long haul state, my best go-to is to give a pulse of steroids. Then is Yagami's nutsack. Not sure if already covered, but what are your thoughts on potential for COVID-19 vaccines to trigger antibody-dependent enhancements or lethality helper 2 immunopathology upon exposure to the wild-type virus, similar to what was seen in Dengu and RSV vaccine? Good question. And we have talked about antibody-dependent enhancement. The basic concept is that the uh, let's say the vaccine is given, which then triggers our immune system to make antibodies, then the actual virus virus comes in that binds to these antibodies, then these antibodies bind to the this immune cells, and they internalize the virus and the antibody and in turn becomes infected. If that happens, if that infection happens, then that is called the antibody dependent enhancement of the viral infectivity. So the uh, similarly, when you're talking about the helper two, so it is also possible that the cytotoxic pathway can go nuts when the actual virus comes in. The point of testing the vaccines with various doses and for two months of the safety data is actually telling us that so far this is not happening. Um, now, is this in theory possible? Yes. Uh, has this happened with SARS-CoV-2? Not yet. And it is not only Pfizer and Moderna. There are so many other vaccines. I think there are hundreds of vaccines. And I continue to look at their trials and their studies and trial phase one, phase two, and some are in phase three. Uh, I haven't seen this mechanism so far. So uh, I would not worry too much about that one. Then there is the discussion here. Green Parrot says, Hello, Dr. Bean. Mounting evidence that MMR vaccine could offer protective protection against COVID-19. The following article has been published today. Do you think we should consider a booster shot? And so uh, then 
there is another link here as well. So here is the link. MMR vaccine does protect. So here they have, this is the, how many of you have had MMR vaccine? So there are many of the folks. So if you see here, um, MMR vaccine is, this adds to other association. Um, the, the majority of children get their first MMR vaccination around 12 to 15 months of age, months of age, and a second dose, one from four to six years of age. Still, it seems that people who have taken MMR vaccine, if you actually consider them against COVID-19, there is a significant effect that their risk is reduced. So that, uh, I think we have discussed that in the past as well. I still have not found a very robust study that says it happens, but there are many small studies that show that MMR vaccine is protective. So if based on this data, you say that, hey, should we get booster dose? Yes. It is not going to hurt and it is only going to improve the chances. Then Vic RV large study. So this is a study that has been a lot of uh, fun in the last few days. This is that Danish study or Danish study where they said that the masks do not change the infectivity. And the study is large because the number of people participating in that was very large. And it became a media frenzy. And, and there, are, there are so many ways people articulated it doesn't work masks do not work and then anti-maskers picked it up and said look masks do not work and so on so i have the study open here and without becoming emotional about it i would just point out a few things there are many things that are uh, incorrect here and it is not by design it is not that the authors were trying to deceive us or it is not that the authors were trying to take anti-masker versus masker side. They were simply doing a research. Here are, here is, let's first look at what they saw. The author said that in a very large study, so a total of three, 3,030 participants were randomly assigned to, to wear masks. So what they did was uh, they asked 3,000 people to say, hey, here are masks. They gave them the supply of the mask and they said, if you go out every day, please wear these masks. So they gave them some instructions. And then there are a bunch of people who did not wear masks. And then they looked at the data from them. And if you look at the data here, the 4,862 4, completed the study. Infection with SARS-CoV-2 occurred in 42 participants recommended masks. So 42 participants who were given masks, they had they became infected. And 53 control participants who did not have masks. So the difference was 1.8 versus 2.1, which is not statistically significant. So based on that, they said, it seems like masks does not do not work. Now, I want to point out a few things over here. Number one, when we think about masks, what they were not able to show in the data that let's say you have given me the mask to say, please wear it. It is totally subjective for me that when am I wearing it? How responsibly I'm wearing that? Am I wearing it at home as well or not? If I am at home, my family members go out, they bring the virus back. Would they make me infected when I'm not wearing a mask? But in the study, I'm going to appear as a mask wearer who became infected. Do I wear the mask correctly and then go out? Or do I wear the mask all the time? That's two. Then number three, we know that mask, this is what they actually talked about. And they said, we could not uh, produce with confidence this message that if you're wearing a mask, then 50% reduction in catching the infection occurs. And that is what we have talked about in surgical mask many times. The transmission reduces from 70 to 80%, and the incoming droplets reduce by 50%. Now, they have only looked at the incoming droplets. Now, was the person really wearing a mask or not? Was the other side who were not given a mask, were they actually wearing a mask as well? What were their habits when they were social distancing? So they said that we told them 
how to social distance as well and how to stay away. So they provided instructions. But I think uh, how well those instructions were followed. And this is their point as well. So if, if I advocate from their side, their point is that, hey, you are asking for masks. And here we gave the masks and gave the instructions. And even then, people got infected. So what is the benefit of the mask, even with the instructions that didn't work? Having said that, I think that the appropriate study for such subjective things is very difficult. We have to see if the incoming infection, what is the rate there? What is the mask wearing? The ideal way should be that then the person wears the mask all the time. And then we see what happens. And But then that practically is not possible. Nobody is going to wear the mask all the time. Then we have to see if, if you are transmitting or not. So those 42 people who became sick, how many people did they further transmitted the virus to because their mask would have prevented 70 to 80 percent of the infectivity towards others. Now, the other 50 who became infected or 53 who became infected in unmasked group, how many of them transmitted that to others? We do not know that data. So there are multiple uh, limitations to this study. They have done a good job. They have tried to bring in some data. I would take this kind of a data to say, OK, when we are talking about mask wearing, we should look at incoming and outgoing both. How many people did I infect? Now, that is impossible to count. So for example, let's say I go to Starbucks to get my coffee and I'm wearing a mask. And how many people did I protect? I don't know. The other day, I'm not wearing a mask. And then how many people did I infect? I do not know. So this, these are kind of issues with this study. I like what they've done. Thanks to them for doing that research. But the study is not um, strong enough, powerful enough to be able to say, let's make policies based on that. I would rather use the data. So there are many studies with masks that actually show that this does not happen. The, the cruise ships studies and the hairdresser studies and the studies in the hospitals. Of course, the doctors um, go and nurses go and healthcare workers go to the hospitals every day and they work with masks. And if these things were not going to work, then even before SARS-CoV-2, doctors would not have been wearing masks. So masks have their, their ability to help. So I would not use this to say, don't use masks. This study can be one study to then further be evolved. What I would take more as good data is the studies in which they are actually using machines to say, OK, let's simulate a person who is transmitting the infection versus a, or receiving the air and then see how much of the particles are going out or coming back. That still is a better data uh, production compared to giving mass and then giving subjective analysis. So again, compared to this study, there are many studies that actually show that masks work. I would take the data from MIT as well that had shown that masks work when you use it with the nebulizers and the machines. So I'll go with still the mask. This study, good job, needs more help. So uh, Vic, large study. So then Vic RV has put the, con the conclusion here as well that they said that the the receiving of the particle reduced by 50%. They did not see 50% reduction in the uh, infectivity. But then once again, when the person is wearing a mask, how many people were wearing a mask and they did not get sick? We do not know. So I'm, I'm going to move on. This is an interesting study, not good enough to give more time to it. Amir Abbas says, question, do long-term prophylaxis, zinc, NAC, K2, quercetin, CoQ10, vitamin D, C, cause damage, harm, kidney, and liver? Uh, so in general, if I ans answered the question from some mechanisms, yes, it can. But the answer more thorough will be that vitamin D can cause calcium mobilization. And somebody had asked me this question yesterday that on one end, you are saying to take K2 with vitamin D and magnesium with vitamin D. 
and on the other, so that the calcium deposition in the blood vessels and soft tissue like kidney does not happen. On the other hand, you also say take calcium with vitamin D. So the thing is this, when vitamin D works, it has to strike a balance of calcium levels in our body. If we do not provide calcium from outside, then it would pull the calcium from bones and that would make our bones weak. So what we do is when we give vitamin D, we give calcium with it. And then vitamin D can then go and figure out with parathyroid hormones to how much calcium to be used. Any extra calcium that is there. So let's say you took calcium and that was useless. You already had plenty of calcium. That extra calcium now either going to get deposited in the soft tissue and we are going to give vitamin K2, MK7 to prevent that. And the same thing is then it's going to go to kidney and get released, uh, excreted through the kidney, and it can cause kidney stones over there as well. It can cause buildup there as well. So extra amounts should not be taken. And for that, you talk with your doctor. Some people have parathyroid hormone issues. They should not take vitamin D and calciums uh, like this because they can get in trouble. Similarly, women who are above uh, after menopause, their calcium and phosphate um, metabolism needs more careful study before vitamin D and those things can be taken. So short term, it is fine. Long term, there can be issues, but these issues can be managed. So it, the point is, yes, in theory, there can be damage, but talk with your doctor and keep your levels correct for your calcium and you're fine. At this time, it's about life and death. So in short term, we should be able to take these. Uh, Vic RV says, is the risk of, risk for being a long hauler reduced or eliminated by treating early with hydroxychloroquine, avermectin, zinc, doxy? Have you seen long haulers at all in your patients that were treated early with your protocol? So in my case, I have seen so far two long haulers. One long hauler was one of my medical students. She is a doctor now. Her age was, I believe, 25, 26. Her parents and the whole family became ill, but all out of everyone, she was the only one who became a long hauler. So about two, three weeks afterwards, she sent me a message that I continue to have repeated fever and I continue to become tired. When I sit down for studies for medicine, I cannot sit up for a long period of time. And I asked her to take a pulse of steroids. And then within two, three days, she said, I have reco recovered. So now, was she taking these supplements before? No. Many of the, the folks who actually reach out, very few cool beans who have been following me for some time have actually become sick enough to come back and say that we have trouble. Very few. And even then, they recover fast. So she was, of course, a medical student or a doctor who reached out to me once she became sick and she heard um, somebody give her my number. Uh, but she she became a long hauler. She was not taking the supplements before. They did th take these things when the management started. Then the other case was where I talk about the person who had cancer. Um, he became a long hauler. But his situation was that before talking with me, he was at oxygen level 86, 84, and the, the, the family had taken him to the hospital to get him admitted, and the hospital ICU did not have enough beds, and so they refused him, and they brought him back, and they were thinking that he's going to die. And then they contacted me, and we started. He had become a long hauler, but that was one of the very difficult cases that I had handled because he was actually eligible to be in the hospital, to be on the monitors, to be treated in a very aggressive and con continuous way. And he did not have that. So I had to kind of, uh, I, I was calling them every hour or two hours to see how the patient is doing and how the oxygen is doing and how his fever is doing and chest is doing and continue to support. He recovered, but then became a long hauler. And then when I gave him a steroid pulse, he became a little bit improved, but not fully. And then I had to give him the pulse once again about a month later, and then he recovered fully. So there are just two cases, Rick, in my um, management so far who became long haulers. 
the second part is uh, Rick Arvi says, what are your thoughts on niacin supplementation? So Rick, uh, I have requested you to send me some link that I would look at and then talk about it. Okay, so coming here to the live talk. <clears throat> So is loss of sense, so Sally says, is loss of sense of smell a sign of long hauling? So I just responded to that. It could be. So loss of sense of smell is not necessarily long hauling. This is sometimes the beginning symptom of the COVID. But then in long haul, it is possible that sense of smell continues to be disrupted. Although what I've seen is that those folks who have sense of smell lost, they usually recover their sense of smell in two, three, four weeks, but it recovers. That is not long hauling. Long hauling will be if for weeks and months afterwards, you still continue to have that problem. So uh, Anthony, this is very interesting. So I have seen long haulers on both ends of the spectrum. But uh, you are correct. Many of the folks who reach out, many of them are youngsters. I think it is equally distributed, uh, but it, it may be that youngsters are more common. Going through the questions. Mball says that there has been a study showing normal calcium in diet is usually enough. Absolutely. Um, So Siegfried says, guess you never read Death by Calcium with Dr. Thomas Levy. Uh, I have not. I do not know if that is uh, directed at me or you were just making a comment. Uh, so Anthony says, question, would a long hauler respond OK to a vaccine? I already had the virus immune dysfunction. Yes. So, so the response to vaccine ideally look you have actually had the bigger problem already the infection and then the immune system got dysregulated now it, is it dysregulated because the virus is still sitting in the gut or there is some virus debris sitting in the cells or it is just immune system being disrupted i will still suggest to talk with the doctor first the the reason is the following if let's say immune system has gone mad and it is doing something weird then on top of that you give the same antigen once again it is possible that immune system once again uh, responds in a more dysregulated fashion and that may be concerning so because i have not seen this is not part of the trials to say what will happen my suspicion is that it can trigger the immune system even more so if i was the one i would first fix the long hauling and I think that those folks who have received the infection have become um, cured. They don't need the vaccine because they have the antibodies or they have the mechanisms in their body to fight with the virus. May that be the innate arm or the cytotoxic arm or the B, B cells. They don't need the vaccine. So Shahida, this is a very good question. So she says that mechanism, how smell is lost was well explained in a lecture, was explained in one lecture. Please say someday how taste is lost. So we'll talk about it right now. It's actually very simple. What happens is that when we uh, eat or drink something, there is flavor. Flavor is a combination of taste plus smell. This is why you can have someone smell an apple and feed him a potato and he would eat that as apple. So what happens is that when the sense of smell is lost, that results in the taste which becomes odd because the, the smell component is not there. So ideally, we have three senses around the smell and taste. One is smell, the second is taste alone, and then is flavor, which is a combination of both of them. So when the smell is lost, then flavor is lost as well. And that is what we say is a loss of taste. It's not actually a loss of taste. That is how things taste if the smell was not there. So 
So logic says I will still wear a mask out of respect. So absolutely, I wear a mask all the time. <laughs> Asadullah, don't say that. So means no mask from today onwards? No, not at all. Um, But once we have the vaccines and the infection and we are out of it, then sure, you can decide about masks. OK, so any questions here which I missed? Correct. So a uh, way that smell and taste together make flavor. And that is what we call taste generally. Um, Shahida, very welcome. There's a question from Jim, Jim McLaughlin. Do you have any opinion on the use of 2 to 3% hydrogen peroxide in a nebulized inhaler? This is a question that has been asked many times. My bad that I have not looked at the studies. And I do not want to uh, expose people to something that I have not looked at or felt comfortable about. So Jim, I'm very sorry that I've not looked at it yet. OK, so I'm going to go to uh, uh, the Twitter for a second. So here we have Luke Henry says, since the Pfizer vaccine needs to be kept at minus 94 Fahrenheit to keep it from spoiling, do you think that will greatly increase the chances of getting a spoiled vaccine, therefore making it ineffective? Do you think the need for extremely cold temperature will be a serious issue? So I actually think that that is a problem. Although they have said that the way they are going to get around that problem is that they, they, they have made special containers in which they have dry ice. The containers have GPS markers on them, so they can track them. And they have the containers have temperature thermometers in them that would track the, the temperature all the time. So they would know if the temperature ever fell below the level that is necessary. So they are very clear about it that we know what we are doing and we have the whole thing already taken care of. But that still stays a concern in my head that will this become a problem? So what happened was Green Parrot then uh, shared this link. So although this is such a bright color, it burns my eyes. So thermostability of vaccines. So this is a, a World Health Organization 1998 where he's talking about, they're talking about the thermostability of the vaccine and how how far vaccine can actually tolerate the temperature changes. So I have not looked at the whole document, but it seems like there may be some wiggle room. But yes, I have that concern. So look, I think what would happen is that as they put the logistics in place of saying, here is a point of care system, here is how we would deliver the the vaccine there, here is how we're going to make sure that on the point of care system, the vaccine stays as cool as necessary. I think that would tell us what would happen. But yes, it's a concern. Moderna's vaccine, on the other hand, can stay at the normal refrigeration levels, which to me gives me more comfort. Jack says, I would like a discussion in potential long-term risk of hastily released new messenger RNA vaccine weighing risk versus potential benefit, why would young, healthy people consider vaccination? So uh, let me first take the second part first. The vaccines are trialed on 18 plus anyways. So they are assuming that the vaccines will not be given to children, at least from the trial data. That is what my inference is. So it is possible that the young and healthy would not need to have the vaccine if their chances are better. However, there are still deaths in there. But the second part, yes, their risk is less. On the other hand, the other uh, communities, the yes, this vaccine is developed very in a short time. Messenger RNA vaccines had not been used before. So we do not know their track record. However, please notice this. This is the first time in our history that 100 or 200 vaccines are targeted at a virus that has almost stopped the whole world in its tracks. So we are all focused on it. We know the genetic uh, blueprint of the virus very well. We know how to make antibodies against it. We know how to generate vaccines against it. We have the most modern platforms available as well. So I am actually pleased that this has happened 
uh, early on and if i got a chance so for example i think i would not get a chance to get the vaccine early because maybe i'm not in that essential group or i'm not in that um, comorbidity group or advanced age group who would be given priority i do not know yet uh, but if somebody came to me and said hey would you like to have pfizer or or uh, moderna i would prefer moderna but still i would take it um three ply mask if you are interested in taking a break from the pandemic maybe you'll consider a video on the on this ra rather incredible study so this is a hyperbaric oxygen usage and that reduces aging so three ply mask thank you very much i would actually put this question to the uh to the cool beans over here to say would you like one day to take a break from the covid discussions and look at the anti-aging effect or age stalling effect of hyperbaric cham chambers. So if you said yes, I would do it. So then is the all source pregnancy. Um, uh, so there is a question from Emily. Emily says, hi doctor, my doc daughter is 24 and 35 weeks pregnant and just tested positive for the virus baby girl due on Christmas day. So congratulations for, for the new family member. Uh, please, could you talk about how the virus affects an unborn baby if mom is positive? I'm so worried about them both. She has mild symptoms at the minimum. So, Emily, this is, uh, you may have listened to my previous lectures. I've always been very careful of talking about pregnancy and the babies and the fetus because I'm not specialized in that area. I cannot provide an expert opinion there. So, what I did was I looked at how CDC positioned themselves and of course they positioned themselves as um, as weakly as possible so here is what they said so first responding to you that she has mild symptoms that is a good news so i'm hoping that the mild symptoms would then re she would recover from there and that is all fine there are very few examples known of mother transmitting the covid-19 to fetus through placenta, very few. But CDC says, and they, they are actually essentially going to say, uh, we don't know. So they say, based on what we know at this time, pregnant people are at an increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19. So yes, we understand that statement. Then considering what you said, that she is in milder state, hopefully she would stay in that state and continue. Compared to non pregnant. Additionally, pregnant people with COVID 19 might be at an, at an increased risk for other adverse outcomes such as preterm birth. I think that uh, her baby is reaching, I think it's another five weeks. So hopefully she would stay safe and healthy during this time and give birth to a healthy baby and they both will be safe and healthy. But this is how CDC puts it. I am not a specialist on the uh, uh, GYN, OB side, so my apologies. Then they, the rest of the page here is mostly how to avoid coronavirus, then to what to do if somebody has the COVID-19. So I hope that uh, things stay fine. Your This message gives me uh, comfort that you said that she has mild symptoms at the minimum. Uh, I would like to know a little bit more, but again, the best is her GYN, OB. Uh, continuing on, Atlas the Husky says, any chance we could get another update from Dr. Paul Merrick and his team would like to know what are they doing to get the word out of the government acceptance and if they need any help. I actually had sent him an email, then I talked with him a couple of days ago. Um, he is uh, hopefully joining us on this Tuesday. So we're going to talk about uh, eye mask uh, plus protocol as well. We're going to talk about ivermectin. And we'll talk about more things that are happening nowadays. So um, please join me on Tuesday. It will be fun. Irvin Boyden says, could Professor Didi Raul be a guest on your platform? I always miss um, his pronunciation. Uh, Irvin, yes, I had actually reached out to him and he did not respond. So, so far, um, Dr. Campbell has not responded. Matt Cram's doctor, I forgot his name, he did not respond, and Dr. Raul did not respond. And uh, Fachi did respond, but said, I'm too busy, <laughs> which is fine. All right, so 
This is another uh, question here, Deborah Lynn Boss, Senate hearing discussing early treatment. So I have the link over here and it is in the description as well. Here is the uh, link to it. I, I checked some parts of it. So just like my own videos are two hours and I do not know how you sit through that. <laughs> I could not sit through this, so I'm going to go and watch it in smaller bits. But thank you for sharing the link. This is another link to the same. Um, so Peter Van Dyke says, it might be interesting to get your and the cool beans take on the Senate hearing. Will it have any impact? I think the verbal and written testimonials of three of the witnesses was very impressive and convincing. I think this is the link to the video. So the thing is this, I was watching some part of it and I was thinking, that is there going to be a change because of this? Because so far, the, the CDCs and the FDAs have shown no interest in early treatments and in the treatments that we have been talking about. Maybe once their vaccine is out, just like they had approved remdesivir, which is a useless drug, but they did it anyways. Maybe once the uh, vaccines are out, and their basic purpose is solved, then maybe they would allow these as well. Otherwise, I think senators listening to these things, I don't know how are they going to influence them. I felt that even, uh, I didn't think that any politicians were able to influence the CDC or FDA to do the right thing. So I hope and I wish and pray that this happens. All right, so back to the live chat for a second. Um, So Joy says, our st state is extremely behind on COVID-19 testing results. Is there blood work I can ask my primary to send for me to get checked prior to getting my results? I'm experiencing several COVID symptoms. So um, as we have done, CRP, ferritin, uh, ALT, AST, LDH, renal profile. So in general, if I say inflammatory profile or inflammation pro profile, liver profile, kidney profile, blood count, and differentials. These are the things that would tell you a lot about what is your current state inside the body. Okay, so. <clears throat> a simple garden says, question, good news, Kathleen Mayor Urga, my DIL is an MD and pregnant and I worry. So do your daughter will know. Um, I think the same message here as well. Hopefully, and we pray that they stay safe and happy and healthy and have healthy babies. Um, please talk with their GYN and OB as well. I am not a specialist in that area. It is a very sensitive area, and I'm not very I'm not good expert there. Wayne says, "I really hate these lockdowns. These vaccine can't come soon enough, in my opinion." Absolutely, I I would take the vaccine and. I'm done with the. <laughs> so Barbara says, Dr. Bean, you're more up to date than Dr. Fauci anyways. Fauci is stuck in whatever world he is. So Kathleen Mayorga says, I have treated four pregnant women with COVID. One was 35 weeks. We used D3 zinc, not high dose and quercetin, and they recovered. One mom was high fever. Babies did well. Excellent. Thank you very much for adding this. So I'm just trying to see if there are more questions here. Siddhartha, I'm very sorry to hear. My manager's pregnant wife got COVID and had a miscarriage. Um, was it necessarily because of COVID or some other reason? M. Gregory has a question, should someone who already had COVID take the vaccine? So that is where I am actually clear. This is my opinion. I feel that somebody who has COVID, if they were, they were not immunosuppressed and if they were not, they are not becoming immunosuppressed, for example, cancer therapy or for example, other bone marrow therapies. 
If that is the case, they do not need to because they have already beaten the virus once before and so their body knows it and they have antibodies and they have innate arm that is prepared and they have cytotoxic arm that is prepared. They, in my opinion, do not need the vaccine. Okay, so um, there is a question here from Lori Ann. Any problems for taking the quercetin 500 milligram, zinc 30 milligram, vitamin C 1000, vitamin D 3000 IU prophylactically? We are following Dr. Zelenko protocol. So uh, the only thing that I have seen with quercetin, and I would actually go through that uh, Twitter message as well, at least one person has said that their thyroid hormone levels the thyroid stimulating hormone has increased because their thyroid levels have become suppressed. And so I have a link here as well to show that quercetin can actually reduce, reduce the effectivity of the thyroid hormone that then causes TSH to increase. So that is the only thing I've known. Uh, otherwise, this is fine. Uh, Dr. Zelenko's protocol has been working. With the vitamin D, uh, 3000 IU, I would once again say vitamin K2, magnesium, and then calcium if needed otherwise your food like it may have ca calcium in it like milk and other things so as long as those things are there this is fine <clears throat> okay so um denise says question what if we are still long haulers uh denise this is a question to this is a follow-up type of a question um what if you're still long haulers? Meaning, <clears throat> Siddhartha says she was very ill from COVID and almost died from COVID. Okay. So, so had the miscarriage and afterwards recovered. I do not know more details. I understand. So maybe COVID related. I'm so sorry for that. So Jimmy Lowe says, is there a place for epinephrine in the beginning of shortness of breath? Epinephrine in the beginning, I do not see unless there is a specific need for a specific person's uh, condition. More importantly, shortness of breath, as soon as it starts, the steroids can help. So this is a question from Goldmuck. Question, Dr. Bean, have you seen either of the two randomized controlled trials in Nigella Stava, black human seed, both shown very good efficacy? Yes. And it is so bad of me that I have not talked about it, even when I was reminded three or four times. So I would work on it and I would talk about it. I have actually gone through the studies. So AS has a question. The math plus protocol does not include hydroxychloroquine. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on why Dr. Marek doesn't include ACQ or quercetin, yet includes zinc. What would he use as a zinc ionophore? So I've had many private discussions with him about that. He is not convinced about hydroxychloroquine to be effective. Um, so that is that. He's not convinced about hydroxychloroquine. The second thing is he also feels that hydroxychloroquine is too religious. He made that comment in my uh, interview as well. So uh, zinc is being used, you know, the uh, quercetin, for example, the ionophores in red um, onions or apples or other red things that we eat, that may be enough ionophore to help. Otherwise, zinc should have some kind of ionophore with it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> this may be true, actually, because Luffy is more up to date than me as well. So Carolyn says, I stopped respecting Fauci when he laughed off vitamin D in a JAMA interview. And he said he himself is taking vitamin D. <clears throat> Shahida, yes, um, remdesivir has not been very useful. Okay, so this is a good question. Zylon, Zylona Papuga says, 
why does NSC give us some of us cotton mouth? So remember that NSC's function that when we talked about it, it breaks the sulfur bonds and it breaks these the slippery things in our uh, mucous membranes. So the, the slippery feeling in our mouth, which we are very used to of our saliva is because of that sulfur bonds that then help us create this slippery saliva. So when you take NSC and if it is more than, uh, it, or it is in enough quantities that it breaks this, these disulfide bonds in all of these areas, then your saliva becomes thin out as well. And then you are not used to it. And that feels like cotton mouth. You're very welcome. So I'm going to go back here. Yes, uh, Luffy just agreed. Luffy has a way to continue to chime in. OK, one more question here, and then I'll go to the uh, Twitter. So Anshu Deo says, question, Dr. Bean, what are the chances of COVID transmitting to child during pregnancy after birth? Um, so during pregnancy, we do not know. There is no stats available. There is no data available. But this is known that it can be transmitted. I think the rate is really low, but there is no study. After birth, the chances are similar as any other contact. So CDC, the, the page that I showed, that they have a bunch of uh, helpful hints for how to protect the baby and how to breastfeed the baby and how to keep the baby with mother if she is COVID positive. So that, and I think that the babies are much more safe, although they say that lesser than two years babies are at a greater risk than the babies from two years to 14, 15 years. I still feel that I have not seen, there, there are some deaths in the babies that I've seen, but I've not seen very high number of deaths. So I think um, most of the people should be able to be comfortable that it will be OK. But once again, not my area of expertise. Uh, Jamie Faber says, uh, question, cool beans are mentioning taking copper, smith, zinc. Can you discuss, please? OK. Copper, smith, zinc. I'll have to check that out. OK, copper with zinc. <clears throat> so there can be a dysregulation of the copper levels. So yes, copper should be taken as well. But again, in the RDA, normal levels. Rita says, I've contributed to you on PayPal. I hope I sent to you. <laughs> I have learned so much and I share my with my friends. Rita, thank you very much. I will check it out and I'll uh, hopefully that went to me. But thank you very much. Um, all right, so going to go to uh, Twitter for a second. Idona says also, if, uh, so there are two questions here. I have a question about Pfizer's vaccine. If the immune cells kill the muscle cell that present the spike proteins, how does the vaccine make sure it maintains an appropriate number of cells with the spike protein so that not too many useful cells are being killed? Also, if this vaccine isn't much affected by mutations, how are other vaccines affected by them? Last one, at what extent can the ARN of COVID-19 affect our genome long-term change? So let, let me just very quickly explain this, because this is a question that I hear a lot nowadays, or similar questions. So <clears throat> imagine that this is our muscle cell. These are our muscle cells. And here, the vaccine is injected in the vicinity of the muscle tissue. And the vaccine has its little um, lipo lipid particles, and those lipid particles then in turn have the messenger RNA things in them, correct? So now think about it. These muscle cells and the other cells present wherever it is injected, we have muscle cells over there, we have fibroblasts over there, we have uh, resident macrophages over there or histiocytes over there. We have other immune cells over there. We have um, neutrophils over there. We have monocyte, not monocyte, but macrophages, dendritic cells. So there are thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of cells there. When the vaccine is given, they are all going to take up the vaccine. And they're all going to start making the antigen, the RNA. And they're all going to start presenting the RNA or the antigen 
on their surface either on MHC2 or MHC1. Or they can do it together as well if they are professional antigen presenting cells. So this is normal. Now let's go to your question. It is a very interesting question. So the question is, if the immune cells kill the muscle cells that present the spike proteins, how does the vaccine make sure it maintains an appropriate number of cells with the spike protein? So what you're saying is that let's say this muscle cell here, this muscle cell picked up the RNA and it started presenting the antigen on its surface. And here comes a, let's say, natural killer cell, or here comes a cytotoxic cell. So let's say there is a cytotoxic T cell that is here. This is MHC1, and this is a cytotoxic T CD8, CD8 positive cell. CD8 positive cell, when that connects with another antigen presenting cell, uh, you know the whole path, right? So it becomes triggered. When it becomes triggered, it kills this cell. Now your question is, this cell is gone. It was presenting the antigen. Now we still need more antigen to be presented so immune system can continue to ramp up. So our muscle cells are really tiny and microscopic. And there are millions of muscle cells that would be presenting it. Uh, or if not millions, at least hundreds and thousands of them. So uh, this will not be a problem. And that is what is a point of testing the dose. That what is the right dose which triggers the immune system sufficiently for the immune system to become trained. So if the, the vaccine was too little in amount and only very small number of cells presented it, then our body is not going to respond well. And then vaccines dose will not work. So they had to give small dose, medium dose, large dose to exactly figure out what is the right dose where there are enough cells involved that they're, they're presenting enough antigen to trigger enough immune response and training. So very good question. I love it. And then if this vaccine isn't much affected by mutations, how are other vaccines? So that is also another very good question. So look, I have done this discussion uh, many times that, so let's say this is a coronavirus. So far, so far, SARS-CoV-2 is known to connect with our ACE2 enzyme using the spike protein, correct? And believe me that when we encounter the SARS-CoV-2 in our body, it starts mutating. It is actually, it doesn't have a brain to say I need to change. It's just that the newer copies that are formed, they have some amino acid changes in them. Some nucleic acid bases are changing all the time. And so more and more new type of coronaviruses are formed. Many of those coronaviruses do not have the right spike protein, for example. And let's say it, let's say it cannot connect with our ACE enzyme. So this coronavirus is going to die because its spike protein is disabled or some coronaviruses may be very lethal and they would kill the person right with them and they would die as well. So only that coronavirus would survive that has the correct SARS-CoV-2 spike protein that can bind successfully with our ACE and infect our cells and continue to propagate. Plus the virus that would survive is going to be the virus that does not kill us so that it can continue to spread. So now let's say that what your question is that let's say for one vaccine, it is good enough to have immune system triggered against this antigen on the spike protein. What about other vaccines? So any vaccine that is bringing in messenger RNA for spike protein will behave the same way. Number one. Number two, if it is a weakened virus, for example, Oxford, uh, Oxford's virus, which is called what? CHADOX1 virus. Uh, this, this is a weakened virus. So it is an adenovirus from chimpanzees in which we have inserted the, the messenger RNA of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, spike protein. That would behave the same way. So nothing would happen. Uh, in terms of the virus escaping. Yes, it is possible that virus at some point escapes enough that it finds a different way to bind with our ACE2 receptor and still change enough that our immune system's training is useless. That in cases of SARS-CoV-2 or, uh, or the SARS-CoV-1 and uh, MERS-CoV, this has not happened. Once our body were able to 
make a response to them, they were not able to continue to survive in us for long. I suspect the same thing with the SARS-CoV-2 as well, that once we give the, give the vaccine, the SARS-CoV-2 would start getting eradicated because it cannot, within us, mutate enough to form a different shape. Yes, the risk is just like minks. It might jump from us to another animal and then jump back from us. That you have seen that this is the third time it caused a pandemic. MERS, SARS-CoV-1 was the first time. MERS was the second time. SARS-CoV-2 is the third time. Maybe it can do that once again. But that is not vaccine's problem. That is a problem of uh, the virus jumping and us interacting with animals. Now, one more thing just on the way. Uh, today, one of my... Um, students, colleague, you can say, uh, she's a nurse here. She sent me a video <clears throat> and she said that you get bothered by some videos. Is this the video that bothered you? And so of course that video bothered me as well. And in that video, there was a woman who did not sh show her face. She was just looking at the vaccine and she was saying, look people on this vaccine, they say CHADO times one. And this is right here. They are telling that they are going to use fetus cells and blah. And she was just going crazy. And she was saying, you can see here, this in the name is a problem. So look, she did not actually know what it meant. So CH stands for chimpanzees. AD stands for adenovirus. So what Oxford did was they took the adenovirus from a chimpanzee. Chimpanzees adenovirus is less harmful to us. Our adenovirus is less harmful to chimpanzees. That is why we use animal virus, or we can take human viruses and train them on animals. Once they become trained, then we bring them back as a vaccine, and these viruses can't do much to us. So chimpanzees adenovirus, Oxford's um, vaccine, number one. That is a name. So she kept calling it zero time one, and she just kept making it some sort of a conspiracy theory that, look, in the name, there is a problem. Anyways, I thought I would discuss that. Um, so good questions here. Now, the last part, at what extent can the RNA of COVID-19 affect our genome, long-term changes? I have discussed it before. I would discuss it one more time. Look, this is a very common question. And that woman who... Uh, I, I'm talking about the video. She was talking about similar things too. Look, here is what happens. Here is our cell. Let's say this is a lipid particle in which there is messenger RNA of the virus spike protein. It comes into our cell. The virus messenger RNA is injected into our cell. This is our nucleus. Nucleus is our, has our DNA. <clears throat> the messenger RNA does not go into the, the nucleus. Messenger RNA is picked up by our ribosomes, those cute little guys that I make all the time, and I sometimes forget their names too. Messenger RNA gets the, the, sorry, the ribosomes connect with the messenger RNA, and they tailor the protein from reading this genetic material. That protein is the spike protein. This spike protein is then broken down by our cell's machinery. And then it is presented on the cell surface as a foreign antigen that we have encountered. In this whole process, there is no possibility of the RNA to go into the DNA and change it. Plus, there is, no, uh, there is no genetic material in this RNA that would have to create enzymes which go into the DNA, cut the DNA off, splice it. Uh, there need to be helicases. There need to be topoisomerases. There need to be um, um, other enzymes that are going to cut the DNA, open it up, inject a new DNA piece in there, and then weld it back again. All, all those enzymes cannot be present in these vaccines just in general. And if they were present, this would be a thousands of dollars expensive product. 
and you give it to somebody and their cell are just going to start dying because what are you going to do with the DNA changes? The person's cell is going to immediately become a cancer cell and the cell is going to die. So the change to DNA will have to be very, very highly specialized thought and what gene you want to change. If it was that simple, we would have taken care of the genetic problems before the vaccine had some conspiracy theory type uh, DNA change in it. We are not reached a point where we can start doing gene therapy by normal areas where we desire to make DNA changes. How can we have vaccines that would start doing it? So uh, I hope that answers that question. I'm going to go to the live site for a second and see what is what is it here. Uh, So Rakesh uh, Rish, Rishi Kisan says central dogma molecular genetics by Crick that is DNA to RNA to protein, not the reverse orders. So uh, there are some viruses that can have RNA from which they can make a complementary DNA from which the RNA will be made again. But you're correct. Normally, we do not have the RNA. RNA would go to the ribosome and make proteins. It's not going to go in and Yes, you can say, let's say we become a conspiracy theorist. Then the RNA has genes on it that would make proteins that are enzymes, that enzymes are going to go into the DNA and cut the DNA and then form some new DNA from where, I don't know. And then bring that DNA and splice it in and weld it. That's not going to happen. So thank you, Rishi Kisan. Charles says, be careful and polite to healthcare workers. They are stressed. I don't know who you're talking about. Um, I'm just trying to see if there are more questions here. So seems like not. So there's a question. Uh, Pasi says, question, how should COVID in GIT, the other, uh, how sh show about show about COVID in GIT, the other receptors do not remember you dealing with that yet. Diarrhea for a long time is sign it is in digestive system. So in the very beginning, when I was talking about signs and symptoms of COVID, in that I talked about the GIT symptoms. COVID or SARS-CoV-2 or other coronaviruses can survive the GIT because they have these proteins on their surface and they can survive the acids. Then they can go, they can actually cause gastritis. They can cause infection of the stomach and the intestine as well. So gastroenteritis. So they can then go into the rest of the GIT cells. They can actually be picked up by the GIT cell. They can live there for 50 days after recovery and the person can continue to shed them in their fecal route. Now, the latest studies that we talked about a few days ago, <coughs> excuse me, they say that the virus that is sitting in the GIT can be helping our immune system becoming more, more and more mature and smart about the virus by the affinity hypermutation or, or affinity maturation. So that is on the GIT side. If there is more uh, discussion needed, we can do it. OK, so any other question? So here is a <clears throat> question. Holik Tahiro, question, if children have found to be better in fighting COVID-19 with their innate arm, then how come that the overwhelming response of an innate arm is an indicator to stay longer in hospital? Very good question. Depends who in the innate arm is responding. Children's innate arms overwhelming responses with natural killer cells. Our innate arms overwhelming uh, um, responses by neutrophils. Their cytokines and their behaviors are different. So that is one of the reasons that chin children's in innate arm is doing better. Second is their ACE2 receptor densities are different than us. So that is another thing. Thirdly, we say, and I, I think that there are studies, but there is no uh, 
data on this. There are studies that because children get more uh, respiratory infections compared to others, adults, they have better cross reactivity or what we say trained memory in their innate arm that we do not have. So when we respond overwhelmingly with our, our innate arm, we respond incorrectly. When children are responding with their innate arm, fortunately to SARS-CoV-2, they're responding correctly. Remember, children actually become more infected and more uh, ill with respiratory infections than us. So they are actually, uh, they suffer more. But in case of SARS-CoV-2, they uh, fortunately, they are better off. <clears throat> Denise says that I am 49 and my NK cells engaged, which is excellent. So that is, remember, we talked about forest bathing and relaxing and yoga and staying happy. That causes our natural killer cells to become more active, and then they can take care of the the. Uh, COVID-19, just like children can. Golmuk says there's a question. There are new now algorithms and predictive assays for severe COVID and long hauling. Could that be extended into testing that might predict COVID-19 susceptibility in the uninfected? Very good question. So we talked about it yesterday as well, that we saw an algorithm that can predict if a person can become severe. Similarly, I have actually come across many studies where they say, here are the genetic markers which can predict if a person will, if they get infected, respond negatively. My, uh, I made this comment yesterday as well that I did not pull those studies together and put those markers together in a lecture to say, here are those markers. But you are correct that there are markers now available. So Rakesh, so first of all, Rakesh, uh, congratulations that you are all safe and happy and healthy. All 13 of you, this is great to know. Uh, I'm also suffering from GIT symptoms. So these would go away. Um, normally, what I've seen is when the GIT symptoms are there, usually a few days later, these symptoms go away. You would still be shedding the virus for about 50 days afterwards. However, I've seen that there are some long haulers which would have GIT symptoms a couple of months after the infection, the GIT would become disturbed. And then they would re recover in two, three days. And then another few weeks later, the GIT would become disturbed. So we'll see as the more time passes. But for the time being, it is part of the COVID as well that GIT can become upset. All right, so there is a question from Carolyn. Question, so will NSE-associated cotton mouth make dental caries more likely since saliva protects teeth, especially while we sleep? So it is thinned out, but it is not destroyed. But if the mouth is dry, then yes, the caries can become worse. So uh, I would say that adjust the NSE accordingly. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to go to the live uh, Twitter side for a second. So there is the, the question from Sam Sup. Can you discuss the study showing prophylactic efficacy of combination of quercetin, bromelain, and vitamin C? So here is that study. Uh, so the study is the following. Synergistic effect of quercetin, vitamin C, and COVID-19, and uh, uh, bromelain for COVID-19. So here is what they did. 500 milligram of quercetin. 500 milligram of vitamin C and 50 milligram of bromelain or bromelain. And the result was, so they used it in healthcare workers and then some other people did not receive this thing. And the result was that in the healthcare worker group, only one person became infected. So they were all taking this QCB. And in the control group, 9 out of 42 became infected. So this significantly um, provided the data that these three things are protective. So, <laughs> excuse me. So yeah, it, it makes sense. Quercetin and vitamin C, we know. And I have done my very first lecture after that Oxford paper debunking that I had done. Then I talked about vitamin C. I actually talked about hydroxychloroquine. Those days, hydroxychloroquine was so I got so threats 
that people said we would uh, get you in jail and we would uh, do this to you and we would do that to you and in those days i i believe that trump has talked about hydroxychloroquine as well so emotions were even more flared up then hydroxychloroquine later on i talked about vitamin c and then vitamin d so i have talked in about vitamin c for some time it is useful quercetin we have talked about it as well yes and then bromelain is the only one that i'm still on the fence because there is not enough data which is always positive towards it so but still this study shows that it works um continuing on Norman Kelly, Dr. Bean, very interested in Pfizer messenger RNA vaccine. Any idea how they will determine if temperature got too high during the process of getting the vaccine to the consumer, which I assume would render it useless? Thank you for providing a great educational service. So in their um, paper that I discussed a few days ago, they say that we have made our containers. These containers will be filled with dry ice and they can stay cool at that temperature with dry ice for 15 days. So that is one. Second, the containers have a GPS tracker on them. Third, the container has temperature monitors in them, and they will be monitoring all of those containers for their location and for their continuity of the temperature. And then they can actually see if the, the vaccine is in the right thing. I think what they're going to do is that the container will be given at the point of care system. And if they refill it with dry ice, it would stay OK for 15 days. And then in those 15 days, they would hopefully use it. <clears throat> Amy says, I would like to know from a practical standpoint, what should we do if we test positive, especially if we are at high risk? My doctor said that she would just watch us. Is there a practice, yours or others, that we can turn to? So um, I don't um, practice. the. Ivermectin is the most important thing. Steroids, if needed, to uh, vitamin D, vitamin C, and other things. Um, maybe check up Dr. Zelenko. Dr. Zelenko's pinned post on Twitter has a link to those folks who may be able to help. But this is the this is the tragedy in the U.S. that people are not able to get early aggressive treatment, and they are asked to go and wait till it becomes bad. <clears throat> All right, so Peter Van Dyke says, what time, please? So I've, I've given the time. This is, once again, Green Dart is giving the um, video of, for the uh, Senate hearing. Kobe Ashimaro, he has some information here. I would suggest that the Cool Beans retweet. So he's requesting this to be retweeted. This is James Kelly. So this is interesting. James Kelly says, hi, Dr. Mobin. This video is controversial, but it is run by a US doctor that also ran as a USA president, presidential candidate, Dr. Ron Paul. It also mentions a lot of B1 thymine as a root cause of COVID and Dr. Lonsdale, highly regarded. So um, James, you and I interact very often. This one video, when I started watching it, and when they reached the mask area, and when the person started saying that I have many ex examples of countries that use masks and get more sick. So when he said that, I stopped it. Because there is no country that uses masks and becomes more sick. Uh, best example should be South Korea and Thailand. They use masks and they become very, very good. So when he said that, it was just unfortunate that when I was just uh, poking around in the video, I reached that point and I just looked at it and I didn't watch the rest of it. So I'm, I'm sorry if there were some decent comments in there. I just missed them because it just looked wrong. Mirror91 says, can hydroxychloroquine be used as prophylaxis in what dosage? <clears throat> So uh, follow Dr. Zelenko on Twitter. He has his prophylaxis as well, but he usually says quercetin and zinc. And if you have to use uh, hydroxychloroquine, I would recommend you look at his Twitter. And on the Twitter, he has a pinned post where he has put the prophylaxis. 
Carlos Ortiz says, Dr. Bean, do you think vaccination or natural infection with SARS-CoV-2 would provide cross immunity to SARS-1 and MERS? Very good question. MERS-CoV and SARS-CoV-1 has not provided the cross immunity sufficiently to SARS-CoV-2. Some studies say that there is some cross immunity. However, this is not very well proven and that may be because the number of patients were less who were infected by SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV. It will be interesting to see if SARS-CoV-1, which is more similar compared to MERS to SARS-CoV-2, it will be interesting to see if SARS-CoV-1 can rebound after people have become, so many people have become infected with SARS-CoV-2. I think it would have a problem. I think there would be a cross reactivity, but that is me just putting a conjecture out based on their similarity of spike proteins. So I'm going to go to the live side for a second. So uh, John has a comment about Moderna. So Moderna seems to be a little better in at least logistics of it because their storage is better. Okay, so there is a question about the thyroid simulating hormone and quercetin and hypothyroidism. So I'm going to actually go here. There is a question here as well. So let's see. Uh, so there's a question here. So I would answer this question in a second that I just saw on the YouTube site. Um, so Mirror91 says, I do not understand what to do with the high dosage zinc integration. Do I have to supply also with copper, magnesium, calcium? Too much pills. Is there a simpler solution? So yes, uh, if you are going to take zinc, then copper can become dysregulated. So some copper, yes. Magnesium, yes. Magnesium, not necessarily with zinc. Calcium not necessarily with zinc. Magnesium and calcium is needed with vitamin D. But copper needs to be accompanied with zinc as well. Jonathan Loon says, can cells recover from viral infection or is apoptosis necrosis the only outcome? Severe cases seem to have low CD8 plus count and high antibody count. Could SARS-CoV-2 viruses be neutralized in the blood mucus? mucus but still hang around within cells causing long-term dysregulation so very very good question and many of them so let's answer them one by one can cells recover from viral infection so here is what happens imagine that there is a cell here and it is virally infected so virus arrived in it and infected it if the virus is strong enough our cells would try to contain it but let's say the virus is strong enough and the result of that is virus cannot make its own proteins. If it cannot make its own protein, then the surface clusters of protein are going to go disappear. I always give the example of imagine my hair disappear. <coughs> now imagine an NK cell is nearby. NK cell, I always call them pervert cells because they touch every other cell. Wherever they pass through, they are going to touch those cells. And so they're pervert. Now what happens is their reason for touching the other cell is that they try to figure out if the other cells have the cluster of designation correct on them or the proteins on them. If the, the cell does not have the right proteins because either it is cancerous or it has a virus in it, then the NK cell is going to kill this cell by perforin and granzyme. I've shown that mechanism many times. So this cell, to answer your question, virally infected cell is going to die by three mechanisms. Either the virus is going to kill it because it is going to hijack the machinery, make more viruses. The cell is not able to make its own proteins and cell needs its proteins to function um, and it, it can die. Virus can also burst a cell open and, and just and blow it up when the viruses are. So imagine the pack of viruses inside the cell that just blow it up and come out. So that virus can, uh, the cell will be destroyed in that. So virus 
caused destruction is one. If that didn't happen, then NK cells can kill the virus, the cell as well. If that didn't happen, then we know that CD8 cells, CD8 plus cell or the cytotoxic T cells, they would also come in here and they would kill this cell as well through the same granzyme and perforin mechanism. So to answer your question that virally infected cell, can it survive? No, it will not survive. It would cause apoptosis or the virus is going to kill it. It's going to go away. Then severe cases seem to have low CD8 count and high antibody count. That is correct. This is seen in all the studies now that if this is the innate arm and here is the naive T cell and this is the T helper 2 and this is the B cell route that is the antibody route, then this is T helper 1 and this is the cytotoxic T cell route, cytotoxic T cell, then most of the people who have severe responses are actually going this route. Kids go this route mostly and they respond with milder or almost asymptomatically. Some people go this route and they are, <coughs> excuse me, they also respond with milder uh, symptoms. Sorry. So um, the question now, could SARS-CoV-2, severe cases seem to have low CD8 count, that is fine. Could SARS-CoV-2 viruses be neutralized in the blood, mucus, but still hang around within cells causing long-term delay? So yes, we are seeing the SARS-CoV-2 hanging around in the GIT for sure. It may be that they're hanging around in other cells as well. We have not seen that yet. So this was a good question. Um, our Krona says early treatment and treatment for advanced COVID for pregnant women and newborn. So we talked about it a few times. Um, Fozzy Al Isa says many of the quercetin products also have bromelain. I have read online that it is useful for COVID and I have heard from you that it may be harmful. I would appreciate if you could look into this and confirm. So as you just saw the, uh, the study that bromelain is useful when given with vitamin C and quercetin. We have talked about the studies in the past as well, where we saw it is not useful or at least bromhexin in some cases can be harmful as well. So there is not sufficient data for me to hang my hat on and say it is for sure useful. Similarly, I cannot say it is for sure harmful. Only one study says it is harmful. So I'll go to this one in a second. I'm going to go to the live side. So. <clears throat> On the live side, here is a question from Jimmy Lowe. Are there immunoglobulin G at home test kits worthwhile? I would love it. Paper-based $1 test kit or this new test kit that is coming in, which is actually RNA-based. But I would love to have IgG-based test kits at home. You would put your blood on it, just like you do your sugar uh, blood glucose test. Put your blood on it. See if the antibody is present or not. That tells you a lot. It tells you how careful you have to be. It tells you if you're comfortable that you have IgGs and so on. So I would love it. Lisa D says, question, does anyone know the answer about the use of monoclonal antibodies after a severe onset of symptoms? So Lisa, the basic way to answer this question is depends how if the patient is still in the viral phase or not. If the patient is in the viral phase and everybody is going to be a different number of days in viral phase, <coughs> then monoclonal antibodies are useful. If the person is not in the viral phase, they have gone in the immune dysregulation phase or they have, if they have recovered, then good. But if they're becoming severe and they're in the immune dysregulation phase, then they can give, be given monoclonal antibodies, but these are uh, lidonlimab or they, they are uh, uh, anakinra or, or the tocilizumab, but they are not against the virus, but other things in the immune system. So Lisa Marie says, my question is, is there a possibility this virus is latent like HSV, we are seeing patients coming back and sick again months after their initial positive. 
So Lisa, we have talked about the long haulers many times. Is it possible that the virus is hanging around in the GIT for sure? We know that it hangs around there for about two months. Is it possible it is hanging around in other areas of the body? Or if the people can have a carrier state, that is not proven yet. So long hauling can be because of persistent virus. It can be because of tissue damage, or it can be because of immune dysregulation. So for that, you have to do testing to figure out what is going on. My patients so far, all of them responded to immune dysregulation. When I go with the hypothesis that they have an immune dysregulation and I give them steroids to reset their immune system and bounce it, they all respond to it. <clears throat> so France Lorraine says, I love my NKs. Absolutely. We all should love our NKs. <laughs> so there is a question. Uh, some people are going to become upset with this. One X2 says, are bone spurs dangerous? Bone spurs can cause a person to not be able to wear shoes correctly or feel pain with the shoes. Uh, Flatliner says, is it worthwhile to present questions more than once? If there is a useful question and I missed it because I was looking there, then yeah, sure. Totally up to you. Um, <clears throat> all right. So continuing here, Rol Rolero says, uh, Chilean treatment. So here is that treatment, uh, this one. So this is a treatment from Chile, flu tag Q. And that is a treatment for COVID-19. The thing is this, I could not find a study which shows the efficacy of it. So that may be my bad, but maybe it is good. I need to find a study to talk about it. Honor UKB says, question, should school kitchen staff wear masks to prevent droplet spread on the food and plates, etc., that is served the same day? How much viral load will cause GI issues? Please, thank you. So this, the answer to the second part, it is not the viral load. 5% of the people somehow respond more with the GIT symptoms. So what happens in them is not viral load dependent. I think it is the route and the ACE receptor densities. So that is the second part. The first part, should they wear masks? Yes. It's not just only to not contaminate the food or the plates, but also to to protect themselves and not uh, send it out to others as well. So here we have King Kong. Can you comment on quercetin and its effect on thyroid simulating hormone and how to address it? So that is where I wanted to show this uh, study here. The flavonoid quercetin inhibits thyroid restricted genes expression and thyroid function. So yes, it is known that quercetin can suppress the thyroid hormones function. It can also suppress the function of the thyroid gland. That can cause hypothyroidism, to which then pituitary would release thyroid stimulating hormone to try to have more thyroid hormone. So yes, it can do it. So then your second part of your question is then what is the solution to that? So of course, one, <coughs> excuse me. So one part is to actually reduce the usage of quercetin. The second is I did some research for you. So of course you can take EGCG, right? So that is a green tea. So you can stop quercetin and you can take e e EGCG. So that is one possibility. EGCG has its own negative effects if taken in large doses. Then there is also a possibility of, take, of taking hynoketiol. Hynoketiol is available as oral supplement. And then pyrethion is a skin applicant. So don't take that. Don't take that orally. But that is a skin supplement, which is also a zinc ionophore. So <coughs> excuse me. I think my throat has become dry. So the, the point is there are other ionophores that you can use. Kobayashi Maro. 
Question, how likely is it that this effect, ivermectin enhances T cell response in mice, is relevant in humans too? Could there be a reason for why it works so well? Very good question. Can someone in the cool beans answer this question? So we've been doing this for some time. What do you think? <clears throat> You're very welcome. So, all right. So let me answer this question. This is actually a very, very good question. So here is what happens. Remember when we talked about um, the ivermectin, we talked about ivermectin disrupting the proteins that take viral cargo to the cell. And then, so the when the virus is there, imagine there is no ivermectin. The virus is there, vi virus is going to cell, send its proteins that would go into the nucleus of our cell and then tell the nucleus not to produce interferons. Now, when the interferons are not produced and the neighboring cells are not told that, hey, we have a thief in our house and you should be careful. And so these are now sitting duck cells and the virus can just go from one cell to the other and start killing them. What ivermectin does is it comes and becomes connected with these important variable uh, proteins. These proteins are called importins. They import the viral cargo into the nucleus. So when ivermectin sits here, it would not allow the viral um, cargo to go into the nucleus, and the nucleus would continue to produce interferons. Interferon would continue to make the neighboring cells more strong and strong. So this is the kind of behavior. So this is not really an antiviral behavior. Instead, it is a strengthening of a cell against the virus. Because of that, when you will give ivermectin, all cells will become protected, including T cells as well. <clears throat> so one more question here, then I'm going to come to the live side. Honor UKB says, question, should people from black ethnic ba backgrounds be in the priority list for the new vaccine, please, because they're not in the UK? Thank you. So I, I guess you're saying that they're not in that priority list. Ideally, essential workers than those who are at risk, which means ethnic communities and advanced age folks and people with the comorbidities, whatever, regardless of their age. These are the folks that need to be uh, managed first. In my opinion, the first should be essential workers because they cannot avoid going out. And if we protect them, number one, we would protect them. Number two, if they, they would stop shedding they would stop picking up the infection from outside and bringing it home. That would help. So that is one. Then the second is going to be those who are at the highest risk of damage by the virus. That would mean comorbidities and advanced age. Then, <coughs> excuse me, my apologies. And then other uh, communities. But of course, uh, ethnic communities first. All right, so back here to this side. So there is a question from uh, Goldmark who says, how does the SARS-CoV-2 protein inhibit the interferon by going into the nucleus? I was unclear about that part. SARS-CoV protein does not inhibit the interferon. So let me, I've done a, a video on it, but let me, if you watch the ivermectin, I've done it. What happens is it's not the SARS-CoV protein that inhibits interferon. Uh, from going in. What happens is when our cell, so let's say I am a cell, I become, and let's say my head is my nucleus. When I become infected with the virus, my head, my nucleus is going to start producing interferon, RNA for interferon. My cell would start producing interferon and I would start secreting it everywhere. So I may not survive, but all the cells around me will become strong based on the message from interferon. That is what happens normally. SARS-CoV-2 is so evil that it can actually connect with some proteins that we have in our cell that bring things 
they are importers you know like people who do import export these proteins are importers they bring things from cytoplasm into the nucleus these are called importins alpha and beta 1 sars cov 2 makes proteins that sit with the importins and they all go into the nucleus these sars cov 2 proteins then block our nucleus from making interferon in response to the cellular stress when the interferon is not made it does not get out of that cell so again this cell may die but on the way to death it is doing a service to other cells to say interferon here interferon here make yourselves strong so that is a normal behavior and SARS-CoV-2 disrupts this behavior Ivermectin comes in and says, no SARS-CoV-2, your proteins are not going to be imported in the nucleus. I would block that. We would make interferon. We will tell the cells in our neighborhood to become strong. And that is how we would block your spread. So hopefully that answers the question. <clears throat> <laughs> so flatliner says head can be nucleus if here is a membrane gate <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right so let me see more questions anthony says any safety concerns with maraviroc since people can't obtain lironlimab i have to do some uh, research on that anthony so I will respond to this after reading it up. I know that it is uh, going to be inhibitor. I have not seen its side effects. <clears throat> Melissa says, where can someone post COVID get treated with ivermectin in the Midwest? So that is the, so post COVID get treated with ivermectin. Melissa, why would you need ivermectin after COVID? Is this a long haul situation? Most of the time, if you are in long haul state, Ivermectin is less useful and steroids are more. <clears throat> um, question. Simple Garden says, do you think that what we are learning here with SARS-CoV-2 will help with research and treatment with other autoimmune diseases? There seems may cross. Absolutely. I think that science, I think it is funny that ignorance has increased as well. And science and learning has increased as well. So yes, what we are doing here and what we are learning and what the research that people are doing, this is going to be a big leap for us to go forward. It is at a very high cost that we lost so many people and we had so many trillions of dollars of damage. Although at the same time, I'm seeing such a rampant increase in ignorance that I cannot even imagine. So this, um, this virus has acted like rain that when it, when it goes on sand, it makes it stable. And when it goes on a little muddy... Uh, you know, um, earth, it makes it slippery. So some people actually slipped and became even more uh, uh, ignorant, unfortunately, and some people became more stable and more strong in their researches. <clears throat> so Rakesh says, is there any test for stool for COVID? I think that there is no test for that, but uh, at least for the researchers, they do the COVID test with these tools. So Daniel said, the patients you have treated on March, April timeframe, they're all fine. There were two patients who became long haulers. They, they recovered as well. OK, so. <clears throat> Uh, 
Okay, so um, Daniel, I have not looked at levolysin. So without seeing a study, I cannot talk about it. So I would look it up. All right, back here to this area. Does ivermectin alter gut microbiome? No. I, ivermectin is not an antiviral. It would not do anything to the viruses. It just makes the cells stronger. Kobayashi, again, not a question. OK, that's fine. Kobayashi, no question. That's fine. Now the vaccines are arriving soon. Can you give us a strategy on how we should uh, vaccinate the population? And what do you think people with underlying conditions can receive it? If the vaccine is still not available for them, what can they do to protect themselves? So of course, the protections are still the same. I feel that if we had early aggressive treatment protocols, we could have gone on without vaccine as well. But the mask and social distancing and staying at home should be there. Essential workers first, then those who are at the most risk. That would mean advanced age with comorbidities, then people with comorbidities without any age restriction, then ethnic groups with the uh, various deficiencies. Um, I think that is how it would happen. Scott Robinson says, compare ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, and cosetin as part of the math plus type protocol. OK, we'll do. I think when we'll talk with Dr. Uh, uh, Paul Marek, we'll see. Lisa Bowles says, what are the fundamental differences between Pfizer's and Moderna's vaccine? Which one would you take given the choice? Good question. And I've been thinking about it. I think in general, they are both messenger RNA. They're both similar. Even their efficacy is very similar. I still feel that the storage issue with Pfizer makes me concerned. Although I think they may, when they go in the logistics, they may actually handle it very well. Because of that, this I prefer Moderna. So this is a good question. James Kelly says, trying to learn more on immunoglobulin A in the mucous membranes and endothelial cells, is it just defensive or does it have an offensive role similar to monocyte, dendritic cells, etc.? So very good question. Let me very quickly answer this one. <clears throat> it's the mucous membrane. So let's say this is our epithelial cells of the um, mouth and nose and eyes and then the respiratory system. What happens is we know that we have this wet layer in front of it, the mucin layer, the, the slippery mucus. Now the, in, the immunoglobulins A, they sit in here. And first answer to your question, they are not aggressive. They're not offensive, meaning they cannot be a cell that goes and picks up the virus and then beats it up or picks up a virally infected cell and kills it. They are just sitting in there <clears throat> waiting for the virus to come that can bind with their, um, with their uh, receptor sites. When the virus binds with IgA, so imagine if this is this pen is IgA, and this is a, now my head is an epithelial cell, and there is a mucous membrane here. In that is the IgA sitting there. When the virus comes in, the virus is going to attach here. And now the IgA with my mucus will be just washed out. I, either I'll spit it out or I would um, swallow it and it would go into the GIT. Either way, the, the IgA would just take the virus, neutralize it sort of by coating it, and then take it out. That is how it works. So it is a passive protection. It is not an active cell-like protection. So we have a, I think we just have a three more things over here. So let's finish that. Tanzo Kang says, according to Dr. Marek, the virus is de dead after eight days. If symptoms persist after day eight and they are not severe, can the patient use Delta Cotrill or calm them down? <clears throat> so the answer to Delta Cotrill is yes. The answer to exactly how many days, it may not be eight days. In some people it is five, in some people it is 14, in some people it is even 74 days after their infection. What I've seen is that third or fourth day, or if there is any indication of breathlessness, 
then giving delta cotrel really helps right away, regardless of the viral phase or not. But giving steroids right in the beginning causes a bumpy road for the patient. They do recover well, but they keep fluctuating. The delta cotrel, of course, the the dose, the real steroid that is approved is dexamethasone. I give delta cotrel in the five milligram morning, lunch, and evening for a few days, and then I start tapering it down. Nina Kant says, question, will kids be behind in getting vaccinated? <coughs> Excuse me. I think so, Nina, because I think the trials were not done on the kids. Kids have been handling the virus better. So I think they would probably not get the vaccine in the first go. No trials on kids yet. Correct. Sure, it's harder getting parents to volunteer their kids. So I think kids would not be the first line anyways. Evox says, some say that recent rise in cases is an artificial, uh, sorry, artifact of false positive in PCR testing. Do you have an opinion on this stuff? There's quite a bit of it. <clears throat> so here is what I saw. I think it depends upon the kit. It depends upon the positive predictive value and negative predictive value that I've discussed in the past. And the um, other thing that is of interest is I'm seeing a lot of negative results. I have a household that I'm managing. The man in the house went out, became sick, came back with COVID symptoms, got the COVID RT-PCR twice, and they came back negative back to back. While before that, a, a day before that, chest CT showed the ground, ground glass opacities. A day after wife becomes sick from uh, catching it from the husband, she she does the test and she is positive. So uh, RT-PCR tests are really not that um, accurate. There is 15% false um, results from them. So these can be positive and negative as well. But at the same time, I don't think it is just the testing <coughs> that is causing the cases to rise. Cases are rising because they're spreading. We should keep an eye on the death rate to actually see the damage by the cases. So that is the uh, Twitter side. We are also at two hours. So I'm going to look at some of the questions here uh, on the live side, and then we'll stop. Um, yes, so uh, absolutely. I would definitely prioritize, if I was the one giving vaccine, the first set of people with essential workers will be the nursing home folks, because that is where the most damage is occurring. So sorry, I did not mention it before, but very good point. Nursing home. <clears throat> um, So Mary, Mary Esther Desha says, what can a state do to protect their nursing homes from patient? Connecticut has 65% death rate. So the, <clears throat> the problem with the management there is that there are people who are going to nursing home because they have to go and support. So more... I have been thinking about it. The best is to have the vaccine. If that doesn't work, then there can be more uh, harsher ways to handle this, that we test, for example, with these at-home kits. We test a person with at-home kit every day who comes into work. So not just the temperature. Temperature doesn't do much. I could have the virus today and not have the temperature and still be shedding. So at-home tests are very important. Otherwise, people should stay there. The attendants should stay there for some time. 
So uh, I think we are reaching a point where vaccine would come in, otherwise at home tests, and then vitamin D levels, bringing the nursing home folks outside to walk in sun or to be in sun, to be in the open areas. These are the important things. Social distancing I've seen is failing because the people who are coming from outside to help them or to attend to the nursing home folks, they are bringing the virus from outside. Their surfaces are getting dirty. So even if they are social distancing, how they're still transmitting. So the most important part is do social distancing, do masks, clean surfaces, but, but most importantly, vaccination, and then um, have the people have this Lucera at home kit to test everyone. Difficult question, actually. <clears throat> William Day says, do you have any f faith in bromhexin? No, I am <coughs> I'm sort of on the fence about it. I'm seeing studies that say it is good. I'm seeing studies that say it's not good. This is a very important question, termite 15. Do you think you can eat, drink enough, um, I believe, green tea to get the quercetin and drink that cherry for melatonin and not take those supplements? It is possible, yes. But the thing is, there is no study to say eat this many cherries or eat th these many apples or onions and that gives you protection it's because there is not study this is possible to eat them but the thing is exact quantities are not known james you are very welcome this is <laughs> this is luffy running around Absolutely. So Anthony, I have lived in Boston area for 13 years. Then I lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for one year. And then I came to California. So I love Boston. All right. So I think this is what we have for the most part. We are at two. Today, we are even above two hours. Yeah. So Luffy is causing trouble. He's just running around. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for joining for two hours. It's more than the Senate hearing <laughs> duration. I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, please like, subscribe, and share. And if you wanted to support my work, there is a link in the description. You can do that. So thank you very much. And I would see you. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow.